Something strange is happening in the world of processors. At a time when we're increasingly being told to save power, our devices want to consume more of the stuff than ever before. Granted, graphics cards have always been a bit hungry. 300 watts has long been the standard for a high-end device, and now some are even rated beyond 400 watts. But processors have seemingly avoided this same sort of power race. Until recently. For the longest time, processors seemed happy to max out at around 100 watts, and they'd actually stick to their rated figures. There seemed to be an agreed upon maximum power consumption amount for your regular kind of desktop processor. But this has broken down in more recent years, with processors breaching the 200 and sometimes even the 300 watt mark. I'll be going through it step by step, but to summarise, Ryzen started this. Because before AMD launched their Ryzen series, Intel was perfectly happy to offer us the same sort of processor every year with the same number of cores, a similar level of speed, the same pricing, and all within a neat little power budget and with a few extra efficiency optimizations every year. But then Ryzen came along and was really good, which made Intel panic, and they reacted by overclocking and by overpowering their processors as far as they could in order to retain the performance crown. And now AMD's responding in kind because if they don't, then Intel has an advantage in benchmarks, don't they? Nothing's ever clear cut, but I think this power creep really started with the Intel 9000 series of processor. At the time, AMD's Ryzen 2000 series was nipping at Intel's heels, AMD's Threadripper series with its enormous core counts and power consumption was threatening Intel's performance crown, and AMD's 3000 series of processors were just around the next corner. And Intel's response to all this was the likes of the i9-9900K, which offered excellent performance but at the cost of power consumption. In fact, that processor was when Intel stopped being constrained by a power limit, and more by a thermal one, where the processors would clock as high as your cooling equipment would let them. This is a tactic that Intel has refined for generations since. And yet, AMD has remained relatively power efficient. It helps that they've been using a more efficient node process than Intel have been, which has helped to make their chips more power efficient. But what's also helped is the fact that the AM4 motherboard specification that AMD's been bound by maxes out at 142 watts of power for the processor. With CPUs like the 5600X, which only have 6 cores, it doesn't come close to reaching that. But with the more powerful ones, you can see that they were all being pushed up against the limit of what the motherboard could feed them. And sure enough, with AMD's newest AM5 standard, the power limits have risen, and with them, so has the amount of power their processors consume in practice. Because remember, it's price and performance that people care about. Power efficiency comes second. But that's just a brutally summarised view of what's happened, and I can't wait to hear from you in the comments section about how I'm wrong about all this. But the way I see it, Ryzen came out with a design that was ready to scale to massive numbers of cores, and this caught Intel off guard, forcing them to provide the same but without such an elegant solution for also keeping single-threaded workloads high. I suspect they had to repurpose server chips for several generations, and given how long it takes to develop a new processor from the ground up, it's only been with the recent 12 and 13,000 series and their separate EMP cores that they finally got a series of mainstream processors that are designed from the ground up with higher core counts in mind. But at the end of the day, both companies have needed to find the best ways of utilising highly multi-threaded chips in all sorts of workloads. And it turns out they can do this best, first by extracting the most out of a particular power budget, and second, by increasing that power budget. And boy, have both companies done this. So why is this happening? Well, for a start, it's extra performance for free. Not for us, because we have to pay the bills, but it is for Intel and AMD, so of course they were going to go down this route eventually. Back in the good old days, many processors could easily be overclocked by a worthwhile amount, delivering 10, 20, 50% more performance than it was rated for. Good luck getting that much extra performance out of modern processors. From AMD and Intel's perspective, why should they let users have all the overclocking fun when they could instead get the processor to better overclock itself, and then to charge users a premium for the best performing silicon instead? I recall the first generation of Zen to be where this really started off. It had all these different power targets and would juggle them about and to try and extract as much out of each core as it could. Sure, you could get an extra 100 MHz or so out of them by manually overclocking, but let's be honest, it wasn't worth it. Zen did its own adjustments pretty well. So yeah, it just makes a lot more sense for a processor to try and operate as fast as it can all the time, because while there will be some who enjoy the thrill of overclocking, most of us just want to get on and to use our computers, and to leave all of the tweaking and optimizations to the processor to figure out. Another reason powered budgets have increased is because doing so is a logical conclusion to processors wanting to get better. How do we rate processors? We rate them primarily on price and performance. Take a look at this review for instance. There's one page covering the power consumption, and dozens talking about the performance. If you were designing a processor for a cutthroat market, would you improve its power efficiency at the cost of possibly losing dozens of incredibly close benchmarks? No, you wouldn't. I also think coolers have got better. With massive heatsinks and liquid-cooled solutions, why not utilise those? 
and if a processor rated at 77 watts could instead consume up to 150 and deliver a bit more performance, then why not use that overhead for that purpose? And the final other reason I think power budgets have risen is because, as processors have become increasingly multi-cored and sophisticated, it has made more and more sense for them to try and extract as much performance out of their thermal and power budgets as possible. Because when you have a single core, there's only so much power you can pump into it before performance stops going up by a meaningful amount. But when you have 4, 8, 16 cores to play with, there's going to be a magical, ever-changing sweet spot to the power distribution between them, and striking that balance right will get the optimal performance depending on the workload being performed. But at some point, enough is enough. Power consumption and efficiency may be secondary to price and performance, but go too far with this and it gets too ridiculous to ignore anymore. And Intel's 3900K is definitely at the stage, where it's now consuming so much power at stock settings that you seriously have to account for that power draw when buying your PC and PSU, and especially when you're expecting your next energy bill. I have a 3900K now, and I air cool it. Some of you will think I'm insane for doing that, but the very fact some of you will be thinking that is a sign of how ridiculous things have become. Yes, if I was using a liquid cool setup, it might take a few more seconds before the processor thermally throttles. Yes, it might occasionally get 100 MHz faster on a few more of its cores. But I don't care about all that because, like I've said, the power draw of processors such as this one has already gone far beyond what's sensible. You want to know the solution to this? And indeed, what I've done to be able to keep my 3900K cool and quiet using nothing but an air-cooled solution? I reduce its power limits. That's right, I'm effectively underclocking that new processor that I just bought. Both AMD's and Intel's latest processors greatly benefit from this. You can essentially halve their power consumption and their performance will only drop by a few percent. Even Intel was bragging that the 3900K at 65 watts is still the same speed as the 12900K is at 241 watts. Which isn't something I think they should be bragging about. It simply highlights how silly it is for either processor to be configured to consume so much power in the first place. Price and performance was king and used to be all that mattered. We've been there, done that, and now companies are taking advantage of it. We now need to understand that those things aren't the be-all end-all, and that with great power comes great responsibility, especially when you're the one paying the bills. And with energy costs being what they are, we're entering a new era, one where power consumption and efficiency should no longer be seen as secondary metrics, and should instead rank as highly in importance as price and performance do already. I don't think that the direction processors have headed is bad as such. I think it's nice that your processor will automatically take advantage of the resources that you provide it, but I do think it's gone too far, and has done because Intel and AMD are keen to extract every percentage point of performance out of their processors in order to look as good as possible in reviews. But reviewers are catching on to this trade-off, and now we, the consumers, need to as well. So yes, getting a small boost in performance from overclocking feels good, but have you ever tried underclocking for those sweet efficiency gains instead? That's even better.